Right. Have we got everybody that are we expecting to come? I think so. All right. Well, if everybody's here, we'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jesse Ferner, Executive Director of the Bucyrus Area Chamber of Commerce, and I'm co-hosting today's event with Miranda Jones, Executive Director of the Galleon Crestline Chamber. Our presenter today is Ryan Gleason from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and he will be discussing updates regarding the CARES Act, as well as the U.S. Chamber's Path Forward Initiative. If you should have a question today at any time during the broadcast, then just please um, click the Q&A button in the lower middle portion of your screen and then type your question. And without further ado, I will hand it over to Ryan. Thank you, Miranda and Jesse, and thank you for uh, all that are attending. I think I was with some of you on Monday, and while that was only four days ago, it feels like four lifetimes ago in the way that the world is working today. So as Jesse alluded to, I'm going to kind of give some updates um, of the bill that was actually signed today by the president, and then our newest initiative, which is a path forward, uh, which discusses what return to work looks like. And Miranda and Jesse, if at any point you can't hear me well, feel free to uh, feel free to give me a shout out. Okay. So as I said, uh, quick updates regarding the CARES Act of what's going on and then return to work. So the Paycheck Protection uh, Program, the PPP, the loans to date, as you can see there, is roughly uh, 1.7 million loans are approved by the SBA, nearly 5,000 lenders, which are mostly local, uh, your local banks or credit unions made these loans. 75% roughly of these loans were $150,000 or less. And the average loan amount was just over $200,000. Um, but today, President, so then I'm sure we all heard in the news, there was this new legislation that kind of was put forth this week. And President Trump today signed nearly $500 billion in interim for the coronavirus bill that includes money for the small business program as well as money for hospitals and testing. So to put it in perspective, roughly $2.7 trillion since the CARES Act was passed four weeks ago uh, has been approved by Congress and the President. So this bill was passed by the Senate earlier this week by a voice vote. Uh, the Senate didn't co did not come back into town and was, re and was approved by the House on Thursday, uh, 388 to five, uh, very, very bipartisan vote. <clears throat> so what the bill included, it was uh, roughly 310 or $20 billion to the Paycheck Protection Program uh, created by the CARES Act, which was passed four weeks ago today. The program, as we all kind of understand, quickly ran out of money because of the high demand. And it, again, it provides forgivable loans to small businesses who keep uh, employees on their payroll. We do expect, though, this money to go very, very quickly as well. Uh, that's why this was kind of known as an interim plan. But about $60 billion of the additional PPP funding will be set aside for businesses that do not have established banking relationships, such as in rural and minority-owned communities. We saw a large problem there where they were not able to get access. And there's an expanded access to aid. Uh, the expanded access was, was a big priority for Democrats who were worried that some businesses were being shut out of the fund. Uh, the bill also provides $60 billion in loans and grants for the Small Business Administration uh, Disaster Relief Fund, also known as the EIDL Fund, um, $75 billion for hospitals, there was $25 billion for testing for the coronavirus, uh, but this did not include additional funding for states and local de uh, governments that Democrats had fought for. So although the bill nearly totals uh, half a trillion dollars, both parties have been referring to this as an interim piece of legislation meant to bridge the gap between the $2.2 trillion in CARES Act and the next expansive round of the coronavirus, which would be a phase four. So what was signed into law today wasn't really a phase four bill. As we we're hearing about these different phases. It's more of a interim bill of 3.5. And so what does the next phase four look like? Um, well, first off, Congress doesn't return back until May uh, 4th, where they're all back in D.C. That is really when the process is, so it's already beginning behind the scenes, but uh, in front of the public about what the next phase four is going to look like. 
I wish I could give you a better idea, but it's like throwing uh, pasta on the wall and seeing what six. We still just, re we really do not know. Okay. So something really exciting that the U.S. Chamber put out last week <clears throat> was a national return to work plan <clears throat> known as a path forward. Uh, and so I'm going to run through you what planning looks like, implementing and supporting. And so the biggest question in the minds of a lot of people right now, government leaders, health officials, employers, the American people and their families is what will a return to work look like? Because we're seeing a lot of that news today. So that question can't be answered really in one question, let alone one answer. It's becoming more and more clear that we won't come to a picking up where we left off. So instead, work will be gradual, phased in, and of course, it's going to vary by location, sector, business type, and health status of workers. And as I'm sure if you saw or read about President Trump's opening up America again, uh, so it will continue to require social distancing, the expanding use of PPP, uh, protective, uh, protective uh, personal equipment, and masks. So, you know, what is needed to return? To help business and government anticipate the challenges that we might face, us at the U.S. Chamber, we began to explore and catalog some of the major implications of returning to work in this environment, ranging from workplace safety and employee rights to liability concerns and continued revenue disruptions. So as you can see here, some of our initial thoughts uh, are detailed uh, through first essential services and resources. Uh, regulation of uh, and legal liability issues and support uh, for businesses and individuals. Okay, so what do essential resources look like? So first is uh, general health screening. So the CDC recommended that some employers screen certain exposed employees for temperature, ideally before entering a facility or a business. So if this recommendation is expanded to cover all employees and potentially customers, employers will have to acquire temperature checking equipment and develop a process to screen individuals. But how are they going to pay for it? I mean, there's, just, there's other general health uh, screening concerns as well as the use of potentially other equipment. Next up is uh, COVID-19 testing. So most employers are probably not well positioned to administer these medical tests. So there's probably going to have to be a widely accessible third party providers, uh, potentially a new industry here. Uh, plus uh, more than likely these, will, these tests are going to have to be frequent. Frequent testing probably, if not definitely, is going to be costly. So again, who is going to pay for it? How are those costs going to be determined? All right, as I kind of alluded to, Personal protective equipment, PPE. So if, if public health professionals recommend widespread use of PPE, such as masks, it will require clarity as to what is needed and who is responsible for providing such equipment, especially if shortages persist, as we've kind of seen in you know, your local grocery stores or convenience stores. Next is transportation. So roughly today in America, 8 million Americans rely on public transportation to get to and from work each day. So public transportation obviously is efficient when it maximizes who it can service, uh, which needs to be avoided during this time of social distancing. So while staggering work times, uh, staggering work times such as examples, employee A, employees A start at seven, employees B start at 8 a.m. and employees C start at nine, this can help spread out the rush hour. But transit systems will require likely some form of uh, financial assistance in order to support a safe return to work. And so lastly, for essential services and resources, and perhaps most important is childcare. So in order for other parents to return to work, children will need childcare. Childcare providers will likely need to operate under suboptimal financial conditions. Um, you know, obviously, there are going to be below, below capacity levels as not um, all employees will return to work at once. And with increased uh, costs, maintain, maintain social distancing and accommodate staggered work times. Um, child, care, child care providers will likely require some form of temporary financial assistance and recognition of the fact that they will need to operate at a loss in order to allow parents to return to work. So, again, where will this funding come from? This is going to be local, state, or the federal government. <clears throat> okay, so so reopening um, a plan 
is medi that's medically based and relies on social distancing and other best practices for public health may raise significant regulatory and legal liability risks. These are in addition to numerous lawsuits that have been filed as a result already because of COVID-19, and litigation risk is more than likely going to become worsened during a reopening period. So first off is health privacy. Uh, obviously, individuals prefer to keep their health private, but maximizing, maximizing individuals' health privacy could conflict with potential reopening requirements in employers that need to verify an employee's COVID-19 status and or other vulnerabilities due to other underlying health conditions. Uh, you know, do they have, if they had a history of pneumonia, the common cold, et cetera. So also there's going to be discrimination claims. For example, you know, employers who conduct a medically based or risk-based reopening using factors such as age, underlining health conditions, may face liability under anti-discrimination rules. For example, we already have the Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and then there's anti-discrimination provisions with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, as most of us know, the most vulnerable population is for the age of 65 or older. And so what is that going to look like when return to work looks like? Can an employer tell an individual who's 65 or older, you cannot come and work? So also employers could face claims for adverse employment actions by employees who are delayed in returning to work and who feel that they are not provided other reasonable employment accommodations. At the same time, employers can likewise face liability if they return at-risk employees to work too soon. Uh, that's a big question. In addition, there's going to be more safe workplace requirements um, and, and resources will be necessary. So uh, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration requires employers to be responsible for ensuring the availability, availability of equipment like PPE and training employees of the use of that equipment. Uh, that would not be possible if PPE becomes recommended in all workplaces. I'm sure most of you, like me, uh, do not have personal protection, uh, PPE masks in our workplace. Uh, so what will that look like? So we're going to need to support independent contractors during this time. You know, businesses want to be able to provide the same type of workplace protections to independent contractors as they do for their employees. But how does that employee and independent contractor uh, separation look? So there's going to be change to employment practices as well. So employers could uh, face liability around wage and hour issues. So think about this, for example, if employees are, compens are employees compensated while you know, getting tested or passed through screening for COVID or other sort of testing that might be required, there's gonna be change to leave policy, travel restrictions, telework protocols, and worker compensation. Also employers could risk legal actions if they do not accommodate uh, employees who either insist on returning to work, even though they have not completed health screenings or are high risk, or simply who refuse to return to work and provide proper support for such refusal. <clears throat> so next up, there, there's a number of exposure liabilities, product liabilities, and medical liabilities <clears throat> that, excuse me, that I could go through, but exposure liability is perhaps the largest area of concern for the overall business community. It has multiple, there's multiple claims that could be brought against businesses that, does, that are designated as essential, as well as large swaths of remaining business community uh, once the economy is reopened. The core component claims in this category is that, you know, did a customer, employee, patient, member of the public, et cetera, were they exposed to COVID-19 in the business facility or as a result of the business's particular action or failure to act? and then that claimant became sick. <clears throat> so legal theories underlining these claims may range from simple negligence to strict liability to public nuisance, nuance uh, rather, and which plaintiff's bar could try to pursue these contingency fee arrangements with cash-strapped states and municipalities. Um, but it's, being, it's really difficult to prove these though through legal scholars, uh, these sort of uh, claims. <clears throat> Next up is customer communication. So businesses today are increasingly communicating with their customers uh, more by reaching out via telephone calls or text messages, uh, which will be critical, especially in the time of social distancing. But this is currently being threatened by litigation under the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. So how will that play out? How will 
uh, businesses be able to reach out to their customers if they simply cannot reach them via text message or telephone calls. And additionally, there, is, there are undoubtedly going to be issues with the False Claims Act as well. Okay. The next slide here for support uh, for businesses and individuals. So we've seen the federal government, such as today, take unprecedented steps to support employers and individuals during this current shutdown. But these programs will need to be modified, as we sort of saw today, and to the extent extended to assist those businesses and individuals who remain under distress under a phased or gradual reopening, including that additional uh, $500 billion that was signed by the president today. <clears throat> But first up are businesses that, uh, that are dependent on high density gatherings or travel. So entertainment venues such as movie theaters, concert halls, restaurants, bars, companies that host meetings and events, and other businesses that are not prof profitable when they achieve this type of occupancy and density is not possible during social distancing. So in addition, many businesses rely on businesses, uh, trade show and personal travel uh, that may be greatly reduced based on social distance guidance. So a gradual or phased reopening that restricts the size or, uh, of gatherings or limit the travel may technically permit these businesses to reopen, but that will mean operating at a significant loss during a period where the occupancy uh, and gatherings are numerically restricted. So these businesses should be provided a bridge to assist them to be able to remain viable once eventually and hopefully we get back to normal. So next uh, is there, there's obviously going to be individuals that are delayed in returning to work. So until there's a widely available uh, vaccine or a widely available uh, treatment or effective treatment for those who fall ill, not everyone is going to be able to resume to normal work activities. High risk populations will need to engage in social distancing or remain at home entirely. Uh, individuals, including contractors who must stay at home because of the risk profile will need ongoing financial support if they cannot work remotely. This will require an extension of regular unemployment insurance, or perhaps uh, we could see a creation of a new high risk unemployment uh, insurance system. And finally, and it goes without saying almost, it should remain the case that if a business operating optimally remotely should remain uh, remote as well during these times. So we're going through all these considerations for a phased reopening. This is where for those um, on the call, you know, perhaps like your input, you know, what additional services do you, do you see is necessary to support a phase reopening? You know, what additional resources do you anticipate needing to operate uh, during a phase reopening? What additional guidance, specific regulatory guidance from the federal government would be beneficial during a phase reopening? You know, what, what additional legal liabilities are you concerned about during a phase reopening? You know, do you anticipate businesses needing additional financial support to bridge a phase reopening? And if so, what form should that take? Um, you know, how have you changed the way that you operate your business as a result of COVID-19? And, you know, what changes do you anticipate continuing after this pandemic? You know, has anyone here uh, benefited from federal support, including the SBA's Paycheck Protection Program, implemented uh, since the onset of this pandemic? You know, so which of these programs and uh, do you have feedback on these programs and the federal response? Are there changes that you would recommend? Um, you know, what do you, what do you envision that you're going to need going forward? For example, some types of uh, standing support for business interruption during the case of pandemic. You know, how concerned are you about potential costs of each support? And, you know, kind of the last question that we're having is, you know, while restoring the economy will be a matter of private sector employers being able to resume activity, uh, what other role should the private sector be playing? Uh, and what hindrances do you see as a way uh, to affect these efforts? You know, what else are we forgetting to ask? So if you're not able to ask the question now, uh, I would suggest that you provide feedback and questions to us at return to work uh, at uschamber.com. The biggest thing though, um, Miranda and Jesse, that I'm we are concerned about is, uh, at the chamber, what, what it's going to look like 
with regard to, is this going to become more of a social guidance uh, or is this going to become a regulatory thing where you have these regulations coming out suggesting, you know, you have regulators coming into businesses. Do we have individuals so far apart? Do they have all these things in place? This could become a huge mess in the business community, and that's why we at the Chamber are pushing for guidance as opposed to regulations. And with that, I'll turn it back to you in case there was any questions with regarding to the uh, program that was passed today or anything to do with the uh, uh, Path Forward initiative. So as Ryan mentioned, um, he offered that email that you can uh, provide your feedback or any questions uh, that you might think of in the future. But for right now, does anyone have any questions at all? It's your time to ask them. Just click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And again, it was, it was return to work at uschamber.com. Return to work at uschamber.com. Question is, we are receiving the payroll protection funds, but are concerned about the quick timeline to return the employees to work. We are concerned employees may not want to return to work now because they are getting unemployment and the additional 600. Can we pay employees to do, can we pay employees that do return overtime? So I think the question is, can they use the PPP funds um, to for overtime pay? So the PPP funds are, the way that your payroll is constricted, it does include overtime pay. Uh, so those individuals, even if, if you're able to pay those individuals, they should be being paid um, because that would, that would imply uh, that they no longer be eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, and essentially what unemployment insurance, what this is doing, the government is paying small businesses so they can pay their employees. And for every dollar spent, uh, on unemployment is a dollar saved through the Paycheck Protection Program. Does anyone else have questions? Again, like Ryan had mentioned, you can shoot an email to either one of us, uh, Miranda or I, and we can forward it on to Ryan if you didn't get that email jotted down. Oh, we have one more. It says, I received PPE funds. What additional program, programs came from today? So there were, new, there were no new programs that were announced. This, this, this we're talking about for small businesses. Uh, there was just additional money that was put into the Paycheck Protection Program as all the funds were exhausted last Thursday. Um, so we're encouraging folks that may not have gotten these funds to continue applying for these funds, specifically through your local lenders. Um, but in addition to that, additional money was put into the IDA loans, the Economic Injury Disaster Loans, some $60 billion. And then the big focus was how much money was put in for hospitals and continued testing. So no new program was established. Uh, and we hope to see more programs in a much bigger package we saw, kind of the CARES 2.0 and the Phase 4 for when, again, Congress returns back uh, in early May. Thank you. We had another question come in. It says, what if someone refuses to return to work? We are deemed essential and ha have had a lot of people working already and have now received the PPP and are in the process of calling everyone back. One person stated they were not coming back until the governor releases everyone. So an individual, if this is, that individual would not be eligible for unemployment insurance. Um, I can't speak, specific. there's going to be specific guidances for each state, uh, particularly in Ohio. I know that Ohio is moving very fast with a beginning to reopen on May 1st. Um, there's also, as I said before, these are some of the workplace liability issues for an employee that refuses to come back to work, but I cannot speak specifically to what Ohio has guide, uh, put forth in guidance on that. Um, just for one second, um, I wanted, if you could talk a little bit more or encourage those who haven't applied for the PPP, um, we are considered um, uh, economic hardship county. So is that 60 million that they set aside for, is that like directed towards towns and counties like ours? 
So the economic injury disaster loan is for anyone. I don't want this to be confused with our um, small business initiative fund that uh, was on Monday that was strictly through the U.S. Chamber Foundation uh, and with, through donations. That's $60 billion for anyone in America because right now America is going through an economic uh, disaster. And I believe that economic disaster is held through uh, July 31st. So it doesn't relate to any specific town or county or state. It's uh, everyone in America is eligible for that loan. Every business, I mean, rather, but. Okay, we'll just give you a couple more seconds to type your questions in here, if anyone has any. And while we're waiting, I will show you my co-host here. This is Lady. Looks like we had one more come through. It says, my local lender is reluctant to answer any questions about the documentation for forgiveness and when the eight week clock starts. Can you give us a resource? Sure, Kim. As to the first part of your question, I don't know off the top of my head. If you want to reach out either to Jesse or Miranda, I'd be happy to give you that information. But the eight week clock starts is when the money is put uh, into whatever account that you have. It's not once you have approval, it's once you have uh, the money that is in your account. Okay, does that answer your question, Kim? Okay, good. All right, so if nobody has any other questions um, and no other comments to make, um, again, we encourage your feedback. Um, that can be forwarded right on to the officials that make the decisions. And um, this will be made available um, on the Galleon Crestline Chambers YouTube page. And we will share it on our, both of our Facebooks after the fact. And we had a thank you, that was so helpful. So you're welcome. So Christina. I guess, I guess Jesse and Miranda, for, any, for everyone that's on the call, just because Ohio, specifically kind of in this Great Lakes region that we're in, uh, if, you if you're hearing anything as this reopening begins, if you could begin to tell Jesse and Miranda, and then if you could funnel that to me, I'd love to hear what people are hearing, doing, how they're adjusting problems, um, no problems, if any. Uh, that'll be really interesting to hear as we kind of formulate it into a national reopening plan. And then lastly, as a reminder, hopefully the next time that I could be with you is when the next extensive plan uh, is put into place in Congress. It'll probably be a couple of weeks before this one uh, actually goes through, as opposed to the CARES Act, which was passed in a matter of days. Um, what, will, what, what, what is where, where there's going to be funding, if there's going to be new programs for small businesses, uh, self-employed, independent contractors, and et cetera. But, if there's no other questions, you know, I really appreciate being on with you again this, uh, this afternoon. I look forward to the next time that we speak again. All right. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Miranda. Thank you. All right. Thank Everyone you. Everyone have a good weekend. Bye-bye.